Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this week's show, we have a new voice for you. This is Claire Corr, talking to the Swinton Circle on conservatism and nationalism. A while back, I did actually do an interview with Claire to introduce her to our listeners. Unfortunately, being new to this, the technology didn't quite work out, so I lost the recording. But I do hope to hear more from her. Her item is split into two parts. The first is her talk, and the second is her question and answer session, which followed. Claire's biographical details would have been circulated to you by email and by on the circle as well. But uh, without further ado, I'll ask Claire to speak for a while, and then when she's after she's got her breath back, we'll um, take some questions and answers. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, well, thank you so much for coming. It's a great honour to have the opportunity of speaking to you all. Um, I'm not a, an experienced public speaker, so, so please excuse any um, um, inadequacies on my part. The subject tonight is, is something that I think is, is commonsensical and, um, and obvious, but perhaps only to me. And, and so if there are any ideas you don't understand, um, I don't mind if you, if you put up your hand as if you were in a class to ask me to elaborate uh, in case um, uh, some points are not clear, but, but I'm just hoping that it will be. So tonight's topic, um, nationalism and conservatism, I've always thought they were more or less the same thing. I've always thought that the role of conservatism is to conserve the national interest. And what is the national interest? Nobody has ever defined it. You have all these politicians saying that they're acting in the national interest, but they never define it, and nobody ever calls them up on it. So you have Cameron saying that he's bombing Syria in the national interest, and, and nobody ever wants to question him what it um, could possibly mean. And also, nationalism is not something that has been properly defined, probably because uh, many people are ashamed or embarrassed to talk about, say, it's all about turfing up um, people we don't want and, and that sort of thing, and they don't quite want to say that, and then they, they just want to talk about the nice aspects of, of nationalism, which is all about national identity and group solidarity and, and all that sort of thing. But um, there was a time when the Conservative Party, or an, a, um, a faction of it, um, such as a Monday Club, who were quite unashamedly um, saying, uh, uh, proposing voluntary repatriation. And I, I, I think um, uh, some of you may be familiar with that idea. That, that was um, a long time ago. Um, I have before me this, this article that I printed out from The Telegraph, and that was dated 2001. Um, it's, it's by a, a Labour writer called Sean Simon, and it's titled, entitled, Some Conservatives Are Obsessed with re Repatriation. <laughs> and they were. I remember when I first came to London, I, um, as I, I got to know a Sikh girlfriend. And, and um, she, she was solidly Labour supporting, and I did meet her family, and, um, and, and they seemed completely convinced that um, um, they would be sent on the first banana boat home if the Tories ever got into power. Um, I beg to differ, but, but, but that was not something they would accept. But then that was what the Labour Party, the party that they supported, had firmly drummed into their consciousness that that, that would be the first thing that would happen to them if, if any of them dared to vote Conservative. But of course, Asian people are, are very socially conservative people, and, and uh, I'm sure they Id identify with a lot of things that conservatism stands for, such as um, financial prudence, um, saving, um, looking after one's family, getting married, staying married, having children, um, and, and all those, um, I suppose, things that the left would find terribly boring. So nowadays, um, Asian Britons would, would be more prepared to join the Conservative Party because uh, they've discovered the lie that the Labour Party had been telling them about being sent on the first banana boat home. Um, but, but that brings us to um, anti-immigration parties like the BNB, who were, in fact, proposing this thing called voluntary repatriation. So, so I would suggest that you know, therein lies the link 
between um, ideas of conservatism and ideas of nationalism. For, for nationalism is, after all, this idea of, of group solidarity, this idea that uh, we should know um, the people that we identify with and wish to share a nation with. And, um, and I suppose the ideal of nationalists would be, um, well, the highest aspiration of nationalists would be to live in a country where our countrymen are as easily identifiable as members of our own family. So it, it gives people a, a great sense of, of comfort to, to think that we can just visually recognize who um, is or isn't our countrymen. But, but that's not the only form of nationalism, of course. There, there's this thing called civic nationalism, where uh, apart from race, you, you, you can be part of this gang, this group, um, as long as you subscribe to certain things or fulfill certain criteria, such as being born in the country or being given citizenship, and, and so on and so forth. So that seems to be mostly what nationalism is about. I mean, I, I would add that nationalism would be, to me, um, promoting the national interest, what, um, whatever that is. I would suggest nobody's actually um, defined what um, the national interest is, but I, I um, attempt to um, have a list of um, things that nationalism ought to be um, promoting. I would suggest that um, oh, the first thing that comes to mind is social stability, social cohesion. And, and, and what does this all mean? I think it just means a general sharing of, of moral <coughs> values and some, some um, some common view about the eternal verities of life. So when I talk about the, the eternal verities of life, we might just sort of look at each other and think, yes, I know exactly what she's on about. Or you could very well say, well, I don't know what she's on about. Um, and I, I suggest that this is actually a very old-fashioned phrase that, that only the older generation would, would, would know about human nature and, and um, so forth. But anyway, what, what we're talking about is, is this idea of group solidarity, this idea that we are all agreed about what the law should be, what morality should be, and, um, and our attitude towards it ought to be. But unfortunately, this is now being challenged um, because I think, I think one of the most important things about national identity is, is this idea of of having a dominant culture. This will, of course, send all the um, minority groups um, um, scattering with nervousness because um, uh, the first question that will occur to them is what, what is this dominant culture going to do to us? It will force us, perhaps, to adopt um, ideas or a dress or, or an ideology that we, we might dislike and will take away from, our, from us our our own individual identity. But I think we can't get away from that. You know, if, if we want our, our nation to be readily identifiable and our countrymen to be readily identifiable, um, there will be a number of things that, that we expect. Um, if it's not just appearance or race, then it must be language or, or ideology or behavior or, or modes of dress, that sort of thing. But let's um, explore this idea of social stability. What does that actu actually mean, apart from ideas of social cohesion and being generally agreed on what things should be? Um, I suggest to you that we will soon know that we don't have it when we have war and revolution, um, crime and civil disorder, a sudden increase in, in um, the population, as well as a composition of the population. So it could mean, you know, a sudden um, loss of population even, an imbalance between men and women that would happen after um, a ruinous war where, you know, many um, men die as casualties and as war casualties, um, an imbalance b between the old and young that, that also causes social instability, um, an imbalance between, or a noticeable change between um, members of the indigenous population and uh, migrants suddenly arriving, as in Germany. Um, this could lead to 
um, a rejection of the prevailing orthodoxy, whatever it may be. Um, we, we have in history um, examples of that um, so during the Cold War between capitalism and communism, um, certainly during the Reformation, there were the wars of religion when Catholicism and Protestantism were at war with each other. Um, and then during the 1848 revolutions, there was this idea of um, autocracy, well, or monarchy if you prefer, and democracy, when, when people thought they would have a different form of government. Um, and now, of course, we have this um, debate between whether a liberal democracy should, well, of course, no, no, that's not quite happening yet, but liberal democracy is now being challenged by um, Islam in, in that certain radical Muslims are proposing a theocracy because they think that might be better for, for, for them and they suggest for us as well. This is certainly what um, radicals like Andrew Chowdhury are saying. Um, and now, um, more immediately, we have ideological battle between what is called neoconservatism and neoliberalism and um, that would be represented by Hillary Clinton and protectionism, nationalism and isolationism as um, represented by Donald Trump. These are ideas that are diametrically opposed to each other and um, so we can see trouble ahead or certainly um, the ones who now hold the power who are the proponents of neoconservatism and neoliberalism um, feel threatened and don't want things to change. But, but let's talk about conservatism. There, there, there's been a few people, a few um, scholars who, who have tried to define it. Um, out of all the um, conservative thinkers I've come across, I thought um, the American political thinker Russell Kirk um, sums it up very well. He has six canons of conservatism. So, um, and I'll just <coughs> read out to you the first one, which is a belief in a transcendental order based in tradition um, or divine revelation or natural law. So this seems to be suggesting some idea of God using religion as an as a, um, a instrument of conservatism. Am I going too fast? No, 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 no. okay. okay. <coughs> The second canon of conservatism says it, um, it, it's an affection of the variety and mystery of human existence. This suggests to me God as well, or, or some um, transcendental um, experience. Um, the third canon of conservatism is um, a conviction that society requires orders and classes that emphasize natural distinctions. This would suggest to me um, age and class distinctions as well as um, sex distinctions. The fourth one is a belief that property and freedom are closely linked. This is, um, of course, quite um, libertarian and American about the sanctity of property and how we should you know, all have a right to it and that, that it should be respected in contract and, and by the state. The fifth one is a faith in custom, convention, and prescription. Of course, tradition. Um, finally, the sixth one, a recognition that innovation must be tied to existing traditions and customs, which entails a respect for the political value of prudence. So, how are we to carry on these traditions, um, I think it must be quite obvious that um, we can only pass on what we have to the next generation. That must be the only way, you know, to, to, well, to have more human beings, just for, for one thing, and um, secondly, to, to have people who, who resemble our outlook in some way. So, you know, whatever knowledge we might have or um, traditions we might have, we would pass it on. And the most efficient way of passing it on is, is through the family, um, through the celebration of Christmas and Easter or whatever festivals 
um, we might have. And, and such things, I suppose, are only possible to celebrate in, um, within the family. Um, we, can, we can have sort of wider traditions, such as football, you know, national days uh, that, that other countries might have, Bastille Day, um, 4th of July, and that kind of thing. But, but, but the, the more, um, sort of more personal and more, more familial traditions that can only be passed on uh, within the family. Um, Judaism is a very good example because there are many festivals in Judaism and, and, and Islam. I mean, it's far more than, than Christ Christianity, which is really only Eastern Christmas, um, as far as I've noticed after so many years of living in this country. And um, for the celebration of these traditions, um, it's almost impossible to do it if you're a single person. You really need a fairly big house and um, a woman prepared to do the cooking. <laughs> um, so I, I remember from my childhood that um, my father would be banging on about tradition and my mother would be rolling her eyes because it only meant putting up with, with dreadful relations of his that she didn't like and, 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 mm. and uh, well she didn't like it, but he thought it was important. I didn't quite see the point of it until now. So, you know, if you're living in a, a two-bedroom flat, you're not going to do, be doing um, much entertaining. Um, and, and as for my childhood, I, I, I do happen to remember that my our Sundays were taken up with going to my grandparents' house because they had the biggest house and we would all go there, the children would play and the adults would talk politics and that was our way of um, keeping in touch with each other. And um, well, the Chinese had quite a lot of um, festivals as well that, that, that um, required a lot of cooking and entertaining. So, so, so I guess this is how it's done. And um, if you don't have a big house or a woman prepared to go along with all the festivities and, and do the cooking, then it becomes very difficult to, to carry this on. And, and, and this brings us nicely into the subject of marriage and how it's important, um, how it is indeed crucial to keep, um, for, for this practice to carry on in order for, for, for any society at all to carry on its traditions. Sadly, however, this is a, an institution that has been, well, diluted in so many ways over the decades. Um, I suggest that um, um, feminism has had its part in it, um, in the sense that everything about feminism undermines marriage, doesn't it? I mean, what, why do women even put up with men? Because... Um, well, usually, usually it's because they own the house and they, they bring home the bacon and um, they have more money than us. I mean, I certainly remember um, a friend of mine who, who said that once she um, discovered that she could make money out of a journalism, um, she left her drunkard of her husband. So um, that seems pretty clear. So uh, that, that seems to be the key, that um, the, the, the working mother normalized the working mother, normalized the divorced mother, and the divorced mother normalized the single mother. And if we're mostly singly parented, then we won't be um, enjoying all these wonderful festivities that our parents and our grandparents used to do um, in their whole families. So, um, so it becomes very difficult to um, pass on these traditions to the next generation. And, and it, it also has caused, what am I trying to say? Um, yes, adolescents of, um, I think adolescents are actually very, very intolerant people. You know, if, if they, um, they're, they're very snobbish, they're very cliquey, um, they don't like how older people look because we're old and uncool and we don't have, you know, the right clothes and... Right. and <laughs> And, um, and, and they're ashamed to be seen with their parents quite often. They like to think that they arrived on earth um, cool and beautiful and young, fully formed with, with no um, input from their parents, um, no money, no nurturing. They, they just arrived fully cool and fully formed and they're not going to listen to, to anything we say because they don't have to, and they've got their friends to be cliquey with, and parents are just uncool. And thirdly, when parents break up, 
it becomes even harder to manage them because I, I've noticed that even as a child I would try to play off one parent against the other. If, if one parent says I can't, I'd, I'd go to the other one and ask if I can. And, and quite often even um, with undivorced parents it works very nicely. But if you have um, two divorced parents, I think um, um, a lot of children do even um, make a point of getting two of everything, can, shall we say. And, and so, um, and of course parents feel guilty of not, about not um, staying together and, and, and they fob them off with um, consumer goods and this makes them, well, uh, shallow people perhaps. They, they have this obsession with, with brands and, you know, cool brands and not being seen dead wearing certain other brands. And, and it makes them superficial and snobbish and, and, and actually quite intolerant. Because if they only mix with other people like them, they won't be able to understand uh, what previous generations thought. And um, um, coming from an extended family, I, I've always found that you've always got all these mad relations who say terrible things and, and were very rude to you, and you have to put up with them because they're family, and if you didn't, there'd be trouble. So you'd have a good idea about how mad people can get, even within your own family. So, so that, that sort of opens your eyes out a bit about, you know, hierarchy and good um, group solidarity and, and, and that kind of thing. And which, which children these days don't, and, and, and sadly for, for many single parents, they, they tend to um, confide in their, in their children, giving them the equality that perhaps they, they do not deserve. And, and yes, and I think that might um, give them ideas above their station. And, and this becomes very difficult in, um, well, trying to pass on your ideas about what is and what, what should and shouldn't be the case. So, and, and the other thing about marriage is, is that um, it, it has actually a, a main idea, which is that the marriage license was really a, a, a license to, for, for the married couple to have conjugal relations with each other. And, and the, the implication of this is that no one else, um, anyone who doesn't have a marriage license is not allowed to have any relations, um, physical relations with each other. So, so that would be a very difficult idea to get past most people now, because the assumption now, of course, is that consensual sex between adults is a human right, if not an actual sacred human right that, that um, nobody will now question. So it is, um, you know, I think we find ourselves, you know, in a very difficult position now. And of course, all these ideas of um, smaller families and fewer children um, has a knock-on impact on a nation's ability to, to sustain itself. Because, I mean, this leads to um, labour shortages, which causes um, um, the, the appeal of, of importing foreign labour um, irresistible. Because um, if, if you didn't have... Um, on labour, then, uh, well, who knows, you could go back to the three-day week and wildcat strikes of, of the 1970s, and, and, and this wouldn't do at all. So, so this is, um, I suggest, the reason why the Conservative Party, um, although they, they sound stern about immigration, that, really, that they really have to um, let them in in order to um, fill the vacancies that um, the, the locals are not prepared to do. Of course, they're not going to tell us why, why they, they're doing it, but, but that must be the reason. And so, for, for this reason, the Monday Club has been slowly, ever so slowly, uh, marginalised and now kicked out of, of the Conservative Party. Um, um, and it was, it's been happening since 2001, I know, and it was Ian Duncan Smith who um, kind of, well, put the boot in and, sa and, and said, no, we can't have this sort of thing being said about us anymore. Oh, I, I found a stray quote. Um, well, there, there we are. I'll, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to fit that in. But this is a, a quote I found from the playwright, a left-wing playwright, describing the Monday Club in 1986. Um, his name is David Edgar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I can't get further left than that. I was in the club in 86, like you. Sure. But, but, but it, it's such a de delicious quote. I, I feel I must um, quote it to you. To you. Um, so he, 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 he describes a Monday club as 
proselytizing the ancient and venerable conservative traditions of paternalism, imperialism, and racism. Yeah. Is that not nationalism? Racism. <laughs> imperialism. And racism. Um, so, well, I think, I think I'll take a, a sip of water now, if that's all right. Um, you can have nationalism, of course, without any reference to race. Mm. So mean the nationalism, for example, of Mussolini and Salazar, which is not based upon the principles of race identity or race superiority at all. No. It's about the, the idea that racism, which is a word I don't recognize, well, and for years wasn't in particular, yes. cannot be equated with nationalism. No, not at all. I mean, that, that, that's actually a very um, helpful interjection, which leads me back to religion when you were talking about, when you're making a point about race. So we go back to religion. Um, we know that Christianity came from Judaism. Um, Juda- Jews are a tribe. And so they had to have their tribal solidarity. And they had all those rules, you know, um, Ten Commandments and you know, adultery and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and, well, to be fair to them, um, they, they have managed to keep their tribal identity. They are certainly the, the you know, most, most powerful tribe in the whole world. And, and that is because they, the, 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 the whole religion makes them do all these things, like, well, the Sabbath, for one thing. Um, they have to keep to it, and, and of, the Sabbath is all about spending time with each other, you know, festivals, and, 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 and this um, would, of course, give um, any group a sense of, 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 of solidarity with each other. Um, well, Christians used to, used to have the Sabbath, but that, that went out with the um, Sunday trading laws, and, and that means our new religion now is, um, well, it is sex and shopping, isn't it? Yes. So, uh, well, well, that is our new religion, and we have to, ex- you know, we're, we're never told these things officially, um, that our new religion is now sex and chopping, but, but it is just by the way the laws um, are, are geared. So, um, if, you, if you say you don't want, you know, you're, you're a good Christian, and some, some um, employees of, of um, I don't know, home base or B&Q have said, oh, they, they're, they're told, well, we don't want you, because you can't work on Sundays, and the whole point of us is, is to, to open on Sundays. Um, so, so if we don't have, even have the time or special days set aside to um, you know, um, keep in touch with our families and friends, we, we will find ourselves um, increasingly isolated and, um, and then I suppose eventually unable to, to, to bear each other's company or, or cooperate with each other to fight the enemy, whoever that may be. So, um, so, so all these things are in fact um, related, I would suggest. Um, as for how to get it back, well, I don't know. How are we going to get it back? We'll have to change the laws. But how are we going to change the laws? Nobody, uh, you know, I, I don't think anybody is, I don't think there is a single party, a single political party in the land who has proposed any measure that might support marriage, unless it's gay marriage. Um, Everyone's in favour of gay marriage, I'm afraid. No, well, yeah, it, 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 well actually gay marriage is, is of course the dilution of, of the, the, the original idea and the original purpose of marriage, which is of course to, to go forth and multiply. That, mm-hmm. that was the whole point of it yeah. all. Um, and, um, and of course in multiplying um, you get the, the manpower whereby um, you know empires are, are acquired and formed and, and maintained but now we have a um, an aging and shrinking population but, but don't worry it's not just you lot you know it, it's happening it will happen in China um, the demographic um, time bomb in China is is far worse because of their one child policy I've met many Chinese people who say, well, we can't even afford the, the only one child that we were allowed to have because they're so, they're so damn expensive, aren't they? So, um, and of course, we, we, we've also heard that the Japanese are, are shrinking in numbers as well because um, men don't seem to want to find girlfriends, preferring to stay in their rooms and play their computer games and that sort of thing. 
So, who seems to be doing quite well? Well, I think we all know who seems to be multiplying. And um, this may be a cause of unease, I suppose, but, but I don't think we should um, look, look upon these things with too much alarm, uh, as long as we understand the causes. Can I just briefly interject and be very quick? The original notion of marriage, according to English law, was set in a law case called Hyde and Hyde in 1866. And it was a voluntary union, the one man and one woman, yes. to the exclusion of all others, till yes. death us do part. Yes. And that was a fundamental principle of Christian marriage. Hyde and Hyde and subsequent laws have never been repealed, which is why so-called gay marriage is nothing short of an absolute abomination and, 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 can't, and shouldn't have any head. I'm not talking about civil partnership, and I'm not seeking to be ungenerous or unkind towards homosexual people, but the notion that any relationship that they may have as marriage is, is a very recent. We are one of 15 countries in the world Yes, uh, have it out of 186. But but the, the the West is intent on spreading it to other countries. Yes. So that may be a source of why, um, well, you're getting a re reaction from the Middle East. They, they don't want it, and <coughs> Africa too. They don't like it. They they don't want any of that. So. Um, and Russia. Yes. Yes. So, but, but but surely the original purpose of marriage what was for procreation, not for recreation. Yeah. Procreative. It is procreative sex, and, and, and of course recreational sex is, you know, was only the privilege of the married. And, and that was you know, how you would keep up the numbers of your population. And yes, so, so the, uh, the conclusion seems to be that it, it's all related to sex. And, um, that, and, and really, it, it's a very difficult thing to, to come to terms with when, when I first came, came upon it, because really, a lot of people don't really care. Um, people think, oh, uh, this will last me my lifetime. By the time, you know, um, the Muslims take over or something like that, I'll be dead. And, 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 and so they, they shrug it off and they think, well, there's not much I can do anyway. Because, because really the mountain is so high and so steep. Um, I mean, where do you even begin to, to explain this to an MP? Will he take up this cause? I can't imagine. I don't think even Philip Davis, who who has who seems to have made a name for himself, um, <coughs> about That's the problem. Half the House of Commons is gay. <laughs> That's what he was saying. <laughs> and and and, and but, but, um, the other quarter is is, is female. I, uh, that might be him. So. Um, so I'm afraid um, I, I've I've just laid out the. Um, uh, uh, well, any more questions? Any questions?